Good afternoon. My name is Chris Konetsky, and I'm the publisher and executive editor for The Business Record. First, I want to thank you. It's so great to have so many business leaders from across the state here with us today for our third Made in Iowa Manufacturing Forecast, which we know is going to help you get an inside look at how this industry is adapting, changing, and of course, what the economic forecast looks like for Iowa's largest industry. It's our goal to help you do business better, and you all are the reason we do what we do. And I know we've got a great panel lined up for you today. Before we get to our program, I do want to introduce the sponsors that are helping power today's event. The uh, Not only did uh, our presenting sponsor for today's event is the Iowa Association of Business and Industry, not only did ABI jump on board to partner during the middle of the pandemic in 2020 to help us launch this event and drive this important conversation, but it also is helping support our Made in Iowa effort this year. As part of our effort, we are once again teaming up to elevate Manufacturing Month. In fact, on September 30th, uh, the issue of the business record is going to be a complete takeover edition of uh, of that edition. It's going to go statewide. We're going to be covering manufacturing. You, you're going to see feature stories and, of course, con content specific to the manufacturing industry. We're also going to be providing manufacturers an opportunity to showcase the amazing things that are built right here in Iowa. Uh, then all October long for Manufacturing Month, the business record in partnership with the ABI is going to be highlighting those manufacturers across our social platforms uh, so that we can help elevate the importance of this industry. If you're interested in being featured in that section, you can reach out directly to me or you can learn more at uh, madeiniowabr.com slash advertise. We'll throw a link in the chat if you're interested in looking at that. And of course, ABI is the heart of supporting the manufacturing industry and manufacturers across the state. ABI has done an amazing job helping its member businesses navigate the past few years and of course, for years before the global pandemic. So uh, it's always helping businesses adapt to the ever-changing landscape for the industry while continuing to advocate for its members. Before we hear from ABI President Mike Ralston, here's a quick video. Mike, welcome, and we'd love to hear from you. 
Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much. Uh, we really value our relationship with the business record and are grateful for all you do. Everybody on this uh, Zoom meeting today knows about the great news and information, the great products of the business record. So thanks very much. And thanks to everybody for following along on the Zoom today. We particularly appreciate the coverage that the business record gives to manufacturing in Iowa. And that's because Iowa uh, is a manufacturing state. ABI is Iowa's manufacturing and general business trade association. We work hard to make sure that manufacturers and others are uh, uh, getting uh, uh, the opportunity they need to grow and employ Iowans in this state. You all know, I think that the manufacturing jobs are some of the very best in this state with the best pay and the best benefits. Iowa manufacturers are innovative and high tech and sophisticated. I could talk about ABI, but I'd rather talk about ABI members. We're fortunate in Iowa to have so many great manufacturers, and we really appreciate, again, the focus of this session today. I will say that people on this Zoom are going to hear from some terrific uh, manufacturing leaders. Um, almost everybody, sponsor and panelist, uh, represents an ABI member organization. We're grateful for that. I'd be remiss if I didn't particularly mention Heather Bruce who is a member of the ABI Board of Directors and one of the state's great manufacturing leaders. So, Chris, thanks for the opportunity to be involved. We appreciate what you do with the business record and looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate it. And thanks again for helping support this and allowing this to be able to be uh, something that we do annually uh, in order to help elevate manufacturing. Next, I'd like to introduce a new supporting sponsor of the event, McKee, Voorhees & Cease. McKee, Voorhees & Cease is a leading firm specializing in intellectual property law since 1924. With the ever-changing and evolving landscape in the manufacturing sector, MVS uh, helped their clients navigate it with confidence. MVS team, MVS's team of advanced manufacturing attorneys are not only equipped with degrees related to the fields of work which they practice, but more importantly, real-world manufacturing experience. Now I'd like to welcome Luke Morehauser, uh, partner and chair of the Mechanical Electrical Practice Group at McKee, Voorhees & Cease. Welcome, Luke. Uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, welcome everyone to the Manufacturing Forecast event today. As mentioned, I'm Luke Morehauser, partner and chair of the Mechanical Electrical Practice Group at uh, McKee, Voorhees & Cease, um, otherwise known as MBS here. We are a boutique and intellectual property firm located in Des Moines. Um, do have clients and attorneys sprinkled throughout the U.S. Uh, as, as more and more as it comes, as the times come though. Um, you know, one thing, there is a link in the chat that I'd like to encourage everyone to click on. It's a recent video highlighting our brand and uh, highlighting our firm. And it's, it's it's a great video put on by another you know, ABI member. I'm sure Mike would appreciate Big Bang, but I'll give them a shout out as well. Uh, look forward to the discussions that are going to be taking place today. And heard a little bit of a preview of some of those. And I think there's going to be everyone's in for a treat today. Uh, advanced manufacturing plays an important role by providing companies the necessary innovations needed to compete you know, in Iowa and globally, new technologies, supply chain disruptions, ever-changing input costs, and evolving product requirements can obscure the path to market for clients in this sector. MVS acts as strategic advisors to manufacturers both in and outside of Iowa, navigating an increasingly complex legal landscape to protect and manage important innovations and to provide a strategic partnership for these companies. Manufacturers of all sizes from Individuals and startups to market leading businesses turn to us for assistance with patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, licensing, litigation, and everything in between. Our attorneys and agents leverage decades of IP experience across a wide range of commercial sectors. We have real world manufacturing experience and degrees in physics and engineering to assess all, of our, all facets of our clients' technologies. We focus on protecting the entire supply chain to maximize value in the marketplace by evaluating individual components and products and manufacturing processes before crafting specific strategic plans for our partners and clients. We thank for joining us today and hope that everyone enjoys the event. Thanks, Luke. We appreciate it. And thank you again for helping sponsor. And finally, I'd like to welcome another new sponsor this year, LightEdge Solutions. For over 20 years, LightEdge has grown to become a regional leader in compliant cloud and secure co-location services for highly regulated industries. Over the years, LightEdge has doubled their team of experts and expanded throughout the region. Joining us today is Director of Sales, Tommy Castle. Welcome, Tommy. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we are super happy to be here. So we thank you for, uh, for including us and giving us the opportunity. As Chris mentioned, I'm Tommy, Director of Sales at LightEdge. Um, we, as brief intro, we've been around for about 25 years. We're headquartered here in Des Moines, and we operate out of eight markets with 12 data centers spanning coast to coast. 
but with a heavy uh, heavy focus here in the the Midwest, um, and manufacturing is one of our primary verticals. So, from a lighter standpoint, our services are very highly compliant, highly available, and highly secure. We're a data center and private cloud organization. And what that means to, uh, to the folks on this call is that in an era where uh, capital is so valuable, we enable folks to outsource and operationalize the data center and infrastructure side of the IT house, um, which enables your team to focus on things like IoT, data analytics, AI, ML, really all things you know, industry 4.0. So uh, we, we provide those, as I mentioned, in a very highly secure and compliant delivery that's always on, always available, and gives, uh, gives our customers the visibility and control they want in their environment. So uh, thanks again for having us today. We're super excited to be here and uh, excited for uh, the event here today. Thanks so much, Tommy. We appreciate it. And thanks again for being on board with us. Well, we're going to go ahead and get things started here. Um, we want to thank again all of our sponsors for helping make this happen. Uh, of course, as we've witnessed over the past few years, the manufacturing industry has been innovative and nimble, especially in a time of rapid change and extreme uncertainty. And the industry that hosts our state's largest sector um, we often take a look at the manufacturing industry to help pave the way and set the tone for what's to come. However, while leading the pack, this means uh, our manufacturers, of course, are often the, the folks that first uh, encounter the challenges that we face in, here in the business community. And of course, the effects have effects on down the line throughout uh, the economy. As supply chain constraints continue to snow, production of finished goods and delivery of products and labor issues continue to hamper production and efficiency. We're going to talk today about how the industry is adapting and what the forecast is going forward as general economic winds start to swirl and blow a little bit, perhaps with a bit more uncertainty. Today's panel is going to talk us through some of their thoughts on these topics. They're going to give you a little bit of peek at what they think might be happening in the future so that you can better plan for your business, which of course depends a lot of the time on what's going on in the manufacturing industry. So although our, our panelists today are, are fantastic, please give them a little bit of grace. We've asked them to do some forecasting. We never hold them uh, fully accountable to those things, but they're going to do their best today to help give you a little bit of a peek into what's coming next. So with us today, I want to introduce our panelists, uh, Heather Bruce, president and CEO of Osmonds, um, Osmondson Manufacturing Company. Heather is a fifth generation owner of family owned Osmondson Manufacturing in Perry, which prides itself on being a leader in the tillage tool industry through quality and innovation. Next, we have Gabriel Glenn, the CEO and co-founder of Make You Safe. Uh, Gabe's an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, he's, his concept for a wearable safety monitoring and recording device for use on manufacturing floors came to him while he was touring a manufacturing company that was undergoing an OSHA safety inspection. Make You Safe is the sixth startup company from, uh, from Gabe, who bootstrapped the company six years ago using capital and savings from his earlier ventures. Next, we have Kevin Kayseri, Manufacturer Advisor at Baton Global. Kevin was President and CEO of Instapro International, a Grimes-based feed and food processing equipment manufacturer from 2008 to 2021, before he joined Baton Global last year as a manufacturing consultant. Next, we have Jeff, Jeff Schick. He's the Vice President of Manufacturing at Pella Corp. Jeff joined Pella in June as Vice President of Manufacturing, a position in which he provides leadership and direction for all Pella window and door manufacturing facilities. He came to Pella from Harley Davidson, where he was a vice president of global manufacturing. And we have Ann Villamil, uh, professor of economics at the Tippy College of Business at the University of Iowa. Ann is the Henry B. Tippy Research Fellow at the University of Iowa and is currently a professor of economics. She's worked in the department since 2014. She's got a number of honors. We actually had her on a little bit of an economic forecast uh, pop-up event we did a couple of weeks ago. She was fantastic. I think she accurately predicted everything that was going to happen over the next two weeks. So we'll hold her to that. Uh, I said I wasn't going to hold the panelists to it. We'll hold her to her forecast as well. So normally we get a rousing uh, applause for our panelists. If you could, please use that chat function. If you could give them a nice warm welcome, uh, help make them feel warm as they begin to help us understand what's going on in the manufacturing industry. Um, one other thing while you're in that chat, You'll, that's a, also a great place that if you have questions for the panelists throughout the course of the conversation, you can feel free to put those in there. We won't be able to get to every question, but those questions help guide the types of things we're going to keep asking these panelists. We've only got uh, about over an hour here for us to dig in, and there's plenty to dig into. Uh, we're barely going to be able to scratch the surface, and so I want to get things started. With me today is our moderator, senior staff writer Joe Gardias, who is helping uh, helping us moderate today's event, but 
He's also our manufacturing reporter among many other beats and has been with the business record for nearly two decades. Joe put together the panel today. He's been working on stories for that Made in Iowa issue that I was talking about. He's the perfect expert to help guide us through today. Joe, go ahead and take it away with the first question. Yes, good afternoon. Um, uh, you might see behind me from the Western motif that uh, um, I'm out West uh, in Centennial, Wyoming, and uh, thankfully with a good, uh, good connection, knock on, uh, knock on pine. <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, thank you panelists for being uh, here and taking the time today. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to start off um, uh, if we can, uh, just for each of you to go around and to quickly name um, what you would say really with so many issues out there, what's what's the number one issue uh, or one just one issue that uh, is really affecting manufacturing right now and and reasons why? Uh, and if we could start, uh, we'll um, I could start up uh, start out alphabetically with uh, by last name with uh, with uh, Heather. Uh, if you could start us off, um, what uh, what's one issue on your mind right now? Um, the biggest issue for us right now is more to do with supply chain, but more in, into depth with that we're seeing is um, the component pieces, the things coming from like Southeast Asia type areas are becoming the biggest trouble spot for a lot of not only our vendors, but also our customers in order for us to supply people. So that's our number one. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, Gabe, um, what um, uh, what issue would um, uh, would you um, um, put out in front? Yeah, I think I would second uh, what Heather said. Certainly, our technology uses a lot of electronic components to give people uh, a real world example. We've seen the cost of a component for our technology that's about the size of a flake of pepper, and I buy them on a reel of 3,000 at a time, and that reel of 3,000 components went from $400 uh, to $36,500 for that same reel of components. And so uh, all of those costs have to land somewhere. And on top of that, because we do a lot of work over in Southeast Asia, um, areas of the world uh, outside of the United States still operate very differently, and they have handled the pandemic very differently. And until just recently, many parts of China, where a lot of electronic components are, are made, produced, and shipped, uh, have been on lockdown. And so we're seeing facilities over there that are still only running at 20, 30, maybe 40% capacity. And that's created a, a, a trickle-down effect, right? And, and the lack of supply, uh, obviously, is a big part of it. Then shipping. Shipping costs, another example, something that would cost us $800 to ship from overseas is now costing $7,000 to ship from overseas. And so those costs continue to compound. You add that to a very competitive labor market where people are, are doing everything they can to find and retain and attract good new talent uh, to their team and fill positions. Um, and it's just a recipe for rising costs. And I'm not sure that we've really seen the end of inflation yet, because from my perspective, we're still seeing it on the smallest of components. And that will continue to compound its way across. Now, I will say there's a couple of positive things with this, because I don't want it to be all uh, about the negative here, but I think we've learned a couple of things. One, as business leaders, we've recognized the fragility of our company. We've found where the weak points are. We've found where the single points of failure are, and it's causing us to think a little bit differently about that. And maybe we'll dig into that a little bit more in the panel upcoming. Um, and then the other thing is, Everybody we're talking to, everybody that we work with and supply safety technology to is sitting on massive backlogs, right? I talked to one manufacturer this morning. He said he doesn't think his entire industry will recover from the backlogs for at least two years, which is a huge positive when you consider the alternative side of that. So again, I think there's, there's a lot of positive that comes from this as well. So thanks, Joe. Thanks, Gabe. And uh, Kevin, um, uh, so um, uh, so you're um, in your role now. You're working with um, uh, with I'm sure a number of different uh, companies, and uh, that gives you uh, quite an ear on the industry uh, across the state. Um, what uh, what's one issue that you would uh, um, uh, put among the top? Yeah, I think the number one that I hear about are, are staffing challenges. And, um, you know, whether that be somebody in entry level positions, uh, assembly roles or, or warehousing roles, you know, all, all the way up. And it really ties into what Heather and Gabe spoke about 
in that the vendors that the, that the manufacturers have are facing those same challenges. And so, yes, there's all the offshore challenges that Heather and, and Gabe talked about, but even local Midwest challenges of current vendors that have might have had you know, lead times of eight to 12 weeks are now double, triple. And so, um, and a lot of that is related to, to their manpower challenges. So that's the, be the number one thing that I would, I would wanna speak to, and we can talk about solutioning as we go. Okay, thanks, Kevin. And um, uh, Jeff, um, um, uh, congratulations on your new um, on your new position, and uh, and with uh, all the experience that you have, tell us uh, what you think would uh, uh, is uh, a top of mind issue. Yeah, thanks, Joe. It's great to be back in the great state of Iowa for the last couple months, having lived here for seventeen years early on in uh, my career, working with John Deere and, and Eaton Corporation as well. Um, again, in addition to what the other panelists have already mentioned around transportation and supply chain, um, I think Kevin is exactly right. We're seeing it in our suppliers, even inside of the United States or locally and in our facilities. It really boils down to uh, labor shortages and continuing labor inflation. The um, labor, the unemployment rate in the state of Iowa is extremely low. It's almost infinitesimal. You can't even count it, really. And um, so it's really hard. So we have to compete for it in terms of making sure that the culture inside of our operations is strong or we have leaders who are, are great at what they do. It's also centered around the um, kind of employer of choice activities related to scheduling and flexible schedules and so forth that can help uh, in that arena. But I honestly still think our challenge here in manufacturing in Iowa continues to be labor shortage. Let me just highlight one other key area around that. And I think it's related to skilled trades as well. We just do not have enough young folks going into the skilled trades environment, uh, whether it be welders, pipe fitters, electricians, et cetera. And we see that as a big gap in apprenticeship programs that we've kicked off. Other activities with community colleges and so forth will help, but we've got to find a way to make manufacturing not this kind of necessary evil that people sometimes view it as, but something really cool uh, to be a part of uh, going forward. And hopefully we'll have some discussion around that uh, today as well. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, and Ann, um, um, uh, tell, um, uh, tell us about uh, um, uh, what, um, uh, what particular issue um, uh, is uh, top of mind for you. Well, I think certainly the labor issues, the supply chain issues that you've talked about in a very specific way at your firms, at the macro level, all of that is feeding into inflation. So we, uh, we did have a better reading today. Uh, you may have seen that the markets went up. Uh, my concern about that, uh, even more so after what you guys are saying, is that there's a little bit uh, too much optimism on that. Uh, because really there are labor shortages and there are continuing supply chain problems. And whenever you have an imbalance between supply and demand, uh, with too little supply uh, and demand has been high, that's going to drive uh, prices up. Now, it's certainly good news. We may be you know, breaking the direction of that curve, but we have a ways to go still. Okay. And... Um... Uh, and um, uh, kind of um, uh, continuing um, uh, with you, Ann, uh, uh, with uh, your economist hat on. Uh, uh, as far as your concern, as far as you're concerned, is the U.S. in a recession? And and uh, really, what is that? Uh, I mean, what's what's your take on on um, uh, the situation right now? Yeah, the U.S. is not in a recession. Uh, the recessions are called by this non-partisan uh, group of economists called the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, the rule of thumb has been two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, and we have had that, but their criteria are broader. They include labor market conditions. And as Jeff said, the labor market is good. The unemployment rate nationally just went down to 3.5%. That is very, very low by historical standards. And Jeff's point that that's even lower in, in Iowa. So, so the, uh, 
the labor market is tight. There are jobs out there. Uh, so that's, you know, that that's that's a big issue. But I'm interested. I was interested to hear from many of you about the backlogs of orders. That's a good thing for the economy, as Gabe pointed out. So so this is a very, very uncertain and really confusing time because people look at things like the GDP reading, uh, but there are a broad measure broad measures that go into making such a call. And some of those readings are quite good, like labor. Uh, in general, corporate profits have been good. Uh, orders continue to be good. Okay, thank you. Um, any other panelists have uh, thoughts uh, on that uh, on that topic on the economy? Yeah, and I think it was interesting what you were kind of talking about, because everywhere you kind of hear anymore, it's we're in a recession, we're in a recession, this is bad news, negative. And so it leads a lot of people, I think, to be afraid. And then that leads to more of this like fear buying and all these other things that just compound the issue that we're having with our order books and everything. So just to kind of hit on our backlog a little bit and some of the things that we're seeing with um, our customers and our vendors is they're two years out. Our industry being an ag, we're usually the last one to get hit with any sort of economic changes. Um, so once everything really starts to correct itself, we'll probably be about six months after everybody else corrects. We are heavily commodity driven. Um, our prices are driven by steel because it's 80% of our costs. And then we're also, I mean, you deal in the agricultural sector. So that's corn, soybeans, peanuts, all those types of things. Well, those are all prices are high. Farmers aren't going to give that money over to uncle Sam. They're going to be spending the money on new equipment. Well, nobody can get new equipment right now. You go to the lots, there's no new equipment to buy. So then they're going to be spending it on other parts that they can buy, wear parts, things that they can fix up their own equipment, machines and all those things. So I think it's like you said, I think it's a good thing. I think the trouble spot that we're trying to figure out and everybody is, is it's prices are just skyrocketed. And it's like, all right, where is this leveling out with the pricing? Gabriel said it pretty well of, it went from three, four hundred dollars for him to buy a roll to thirty five hundred dollars. And it's that doesn't seem like it's slowing down yet. Prices are decreasing slowly, but not at a rate that I feel like anybody's able to really put a pulse on. Jeff, I yeah, wonder. So let me just jump in on that. I, 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 you, you made two points. One is that there's sort of this gloom, doom and gloom. Doom and gloom in, in and of itself is of concern because consumption is actually about 70% of GDP. So if everybody just gets scared uh, and pulls back on consumption, that alone can, can cause problems. So that's why I think it's really helpful to hear from you guys that on the ground, yeah, you're having problems, but your order books are good. That's that's a big deal. I mean, again, unless somehow everybody would, uh, would pull back. Heather, I think it's particularly interesting to hear from you on um, the agricultural and commodity side, because that also feeds into geopolitical things, Ukraine, uh, Russia. Uh, and, and I think that's an exciting opportunity for Iowa in particular. Over time, as we have these problems, we're just gonna get more productive whether it's machines, seeds, you know, and by that I include global challenges. Uh, so I think it's a pretty exciting time, but it's gonna take some time to, to get the, these things online. You, know, you pointed out there are backlogs, there aren't, there aren't machines on, on lots, but then there needs to be some certainty for long-term investment to do certain things. Uh, because is this just a temporary problem? You know, people look at the price of energy right now and I, people who are listening to us, not very long ago, the price of energy was negative, not just zero, negative, because you had excess oil that had to be put on uh, tankers as a place to, to, to store it. Uh, so, so those kinds of volatilities are just tough for firms to deal with. I see. And, uh, hey, Joe, ahead, Chris. Yeah, I see Gabe's got his hand up and probably wants to chime in. And then after Gabe goes, I'd love to have Jeff uh, from, a, obviously, your industry is so connected into housing, which we've heard some rumblings around. So Gabe, we'll have you go first, and then maybe we'll bounce over to Jeff. Yeah, I, thanks, Chris. And Anne 
has forgotten more about macroeconomics than I'll probably ever know. So she might have a di different take on this, but I think what we're in for seeing is a little bit of an accordion effect. Uh, it's not, we're gonna have some false peaks and we're gonna have some false bottoms. I don't think it's gonna be this nice arcing smooth curve where we see things you know, peak out and, and start to get better and then just eventually stay better. Um, just because, especially in the electronics component world, we're seeing this huge glut of people buy, buying up as much as they can. It's the fear button. It's like uh, silicon chips are the new toilet paper, right, for the pandemic. And so everybody's out there trying to get as much as they can, and they're placing orders with three, four, five different suppliers for a million, 10 million of these things, and then they'll cancel the other ones when stuff comes in. And so the market responded by saying, okay, we're not going to allow any cancellations or returns. And so now you have people that are sitting on stockpiles. And just in the last couple of weeks, we're seeing prices start to come down on that. And we're seeing that with chip uh, manufacturers reporting earnings and talking about their forecasted earnings coming up on Wall Street. And we've seen the semiconductor industry take a massive hit here in the last few days. And so I think what's going to happen is we might end up getting a huge flood of all this stuff, which will create some acceleration as long as we can get the bodies in there to help produce it. Um, and, and then again, just just the, the peaks and valleys before it really comes out. And so I think the smart business leaders will will find the opportunities to um, to take advantage of when they're in the right place and then take the take advantage of being able to hold back or, or, or wait back when they can um, when we're in those valleys. So. Yeah, yeah I think let me just wait. yeah no thanks Chris let me just weigh in there a little bit I think demand demand volatility is a big deal Gabe and you hit it you hit it right on and it's not just cyclical like it used to be or seasonal it's because of ordering patterns of folks based on this high variation of lead time inside of the supply chain and highly um, volatile availability of products and those who can figure out how to win in the um, availability game with products are tending to win um, right now. In the housing market, again, I've been in the industry now <clears throat> a couple of, of uh, months. I did have the luxury of working for Kohler Company as well during my career, so in the kitchen and bath space. But I can tell you at the macro level, it still feels like there's strong opportunity in the construction space. There's still fewer houses. Rents are still <clears throat> really high. Obviously, all of that is driving inflationary pressures and taking money out of people's paychecks who could otherwise buy, you know, things uh, with it as well. But at the macro level, I think it's still there. Now, you'll see things happening like spec changes on houses. So instead of a um, $400,000 house, it might be a $300,000 house in order to keep monthly payments the same for the, based on the interest rates that are out there. And that may mean uh, a little less lumber, maybe a few fewer windows, et cetera. So we're seeing some of that in the bookings trends, but the backlog is still uh, strong and uh, the lead times are still ex extended depending upon the product mix. And that's where I come back to this demand volatility that we see in the order bookings where folks are looking for what's available, not even exactly necessarily um, what they want, but that is creating a lot of volatility that we're having to try to plan our supply uh, around as well. And Joe, I, I think I'll just jump in real quick um, and add to the conversation here about projecting and forecasting. You know, uh, you, you brought it up previously in, in, in another discussion we had, this VUCA world we live in, the volatility, uncertain complexity and ambiguity, really tough to forecast in, in that type of environment because you can't predict what's coming down the road um, the Ukraines of the world, the COVIDs of the world, and, and so forth. And so planning around that, establishing uh, strategies and business practices to deal with that, increasing your shock absorbers. Maybe you had a cash level that you, you normally would try to carry. Now it might make sense to increase that a, a little bit. So um, there are different approaches to handling that 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 those unpredictable events, but really number one is stay focused on what drives your business. Stay focused on your north star, what your mission and in, in, in your uh, your how to win philosophy, um, and 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 then address those issues with those shock absorbers that I mentioned. And um, 
And so, um, uh, and one major thing that um, that seems to be coming up again and again is the uh, uh, is the labor shortage and uh, and the effects that that's having. Um, uh, I guess um, uh, looking at looking at supply and demand, uh, how much really is that affecting um, wages? Um, and um, and are you? Um, I mean, or uh, increasing benefits. I mean, what's the environment like for attracting and retaining uh, quality workers at this point? If um, uh, if if any of you would like to um, uh, take a uh, take some time talking about that, I'll start again. Um, so we do it a little differently around our area. I think I'm sure everybody sees some form of hiring sign-on bonuses all sorts of different incentives to get people in the door. Um, we're actually leaning more on our current employees and we're going by referral programs instead. And that seems to be helping us a ton um, when it comes to getting people to stay. The hard part isn't getting someone in the door. That was the easy part. It's getting them to stay past the 90 days. It used to be pre-pandemic. I could get somebody benefited and they would stay at least three years. Now I'm lucky if I get somebody benefited for them to stay six months. <clears throat> so the referral program has been tremendously helpful. And then unfortunately, because I am in a small town with four other industries of manufacturing of some format, we're competing with each other. I'm not only competing with Des Moines and a 30 mile radius of where I'm located. I'm also competing with just right in my own backyard of people. And with all the new companies coming into Iowa, it's making it even harder to re retain people because there's, it seems to be nobody really wants to do the kind of like Jeff talked about with the manufacturing, everybody's like, oh, it's manufacturing, it's harder work, it's this, it's that, it's not that cool, sexy technology or whatever it is. And it's like, all right, so that's one of the things that we're looking into. I know somebody commented in the chat about automation. I think that's where everybody's minds go to, but how do you do automation with people? Because people is still what makes Iowa. And, um, and, uh... One of you in your responses um, uh, for our pre-event uh, question that we published had mentioned um, about um, the, um, the use of technology in supplementing um, uh, the labor force. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, is this, um, uh, are conditions really driving technology um, or uh, technology investments right now as a way to uh, supplement or augment um, uh, labor uh, when there's shortages? You know, I might have said, uh, said that in my uh, pre-comments. And that gets back to the points being raised by people on the ground on this pa panel. The, the answer, as it almost always is in economics, is it depends. So if these are short-term fluctuations, then then you're just going to try and tighten your belt and sail through them. But if we know that this is a long term change, then, yes, you have to bite the bullet uh, and and invest in those new technologies. And that's why all of this uncertainty and ambiguity uh, that, that others have mentioned is just crucial right now. Okay. And Gabe, uh, I see you've got your uh, hand raised. Um, uh, go ahead. Sorry, it's my my classroom days here in Iowa. Can I answer? It's interesting. You know, uh, we're in the workplace safety space, and we're seeing um, we're seeing companies invest significant dollars into improving the health and happiness and function of the worker because they know that they need to be able to attract people. They need to be able to retain. And two immediate examples pop into mind on a call last week with one of our customers. They just had invested in two uh, very large cooling systems. Uh, for their production facility because data that was gathered through our technology told them that, that, that their employees were in the extreme risk category for heat exposure, right? And, and something that maybe five or 10 years ago wouldn't be an investment that a company would have the ability to make or be willing to make is something that they're absolutely looking at now and going, okay, there's there's the cost of that, but then there's the big benefit back to us. And another one is a, another Iowa manufacturer here um, investing in robotic technology, right, to improve 
um, the, 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 the risk of musculoskeletal disorders, right? Losing workers because of an injury or because of repetitive motion or uh, just hard physical labor um, is a cost that a company can't take on right now. They can't even fill the seats that they have. And so we're at least seeing significant investment in improvement of the environment, improvement of the job, the job functions and job processes. And I think that's a complete shift from where companies were looking, you know, even just a few years ago. Okay. Thank you. And Jeff, uh, did you have something to, um, to, uh, to add on that? Yeah, or? yeah just to pile on uh, with what uh, Gabe was saying, you know, automation has used to be kind of, um, can we get a payback? Is there cost reduction associated with it? And it's more of an HR strategy right now because uh, we can't get folks. Yes, absenteeism rates have been higher. They're getting better now that the pandemic's coming to an end, right? But they used to be higher and we used to have to plan for those things. And so not only are we seeing automation in places where it's maybe easier to do on the packaging side of the equation, for example, on the material handling side, a lot more uh, mobile industrial ro robots roaming around the factories, what used to be maybe called AGVs, but the technology is so much improved on those. They drive with cameras, much like a car drives on the road by itself today, right? So it's a lot easier to do and apply technologies like that which means you can free up somebody who's doing an indirect role on material handling and have them go build windows or doors um, or other things uh, inside of the operation that might be a little bit more value added. And then I'll throw one more thing out there on the technology front, the use of cobots is becoming more popular because now, as you mentioned, Heather, I mean, you gotta have people, but you also, there's assisted uh, uh, cobots out there that can work around people without the big fences and light curtains and all the safety things that you might have to have in place when you see those big yellow and orange, you know, robots spinning around your factories. Um, the cobots can be a very helpful complement to um, a team or an area that can then maybe reduce the reliance on um, folks a little bit as a result of having that. Plus, as Gabe mentioned, there's safety gains to be made. I mean, you want people to retire from our operations in a way that they can still go enjoy a very high quality of life. So, ergonomics and safety can be facilitated by some of the automation that's, that's put in place. Okay, and um, um, Heather, what's, uh, um, what's uh, you were um, nodding your head about the cobots, and is that um, uh, is that a, a, an area that you're? Um, uh, I take it that you're investing in, or, or have invested in. Well, we haven't invested in any robotics, so to speak, yet. We're just kind of dipping our toes because we are a forge, so dealing with robotics with um, being able to the vision and aspect of things is very challenging right now because you can't see the difference between a thousand degree part and a thousand degree furnace. <laughs> um, but we are looking into investing into cobots. We're looking into some of our cold work into some of that kind of stuff. And we're working with Cirrus um, and then another marketing company in Des Moines to try to kind of help combat that issue with the visual in order to be able to have some of the robotics and things. And it's just like Jeff said, it's more to do with how do I take this manual labor aspect out of it and utilize the person for their mind more so than just the physical labor? Gone are the days of having the 18 to 30 year old men from the farm basically being able to do these hard labor works anymore. So, I mean, our industry itself has changed. 15 years ago, you wouldn't have found a single woman on our shop floor and now we have um, eight of them. All different races, all different, um, ages and things. And so it's been extremely helpful trying to invest in these types of technologies to be able to make the work easier so that I can go after women, older demographics in like the forties and fifties and types of things, instead of just going after the really young able-bodied people. So it's been, it's been very helpful for us. And uh, and along the lines of- um, Hey Joe, it looks like uh, yes. Kevin, was gonna, Kevin was gonna chime in there as well. Just wanna make sure to catch oh. him. Okay, um, Kevin, you go ahead. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Chris and Joe. Um, yeah, and this labor cost issue, you know, is is a real problem. Um, and the area that we're leaning into is some of you brought it up is on retention. And there's just this beyond the cost of acquiring that additional that that, that replacement employee. There's the cost of the loss in productivity, right? Because you got to onboard, you got to train, and so that churn increases. Um, that cost increases the lack of productivity. So the best solution is to retain those folks 
And it's not just about the, the, the common denominator in the, in the wage level. Um, we're bringing tools to the party to really understand what's going on with your employees. How are they working together? How can we create the environment that's more productive for them? And it's well beyond your, your, your common um, employee satisfaction survey. It's really understanding how are they working? What do they need to be more productive? How can we make them uh, more productive? And in so uh, increasing their satisfaction and then increasing their retention. Thanks, Kevin. And, and in the uh, current environment, I mean, uh, remote work has been an issue for um, a number of um, um, industries, but not so for the service industry and not so for manufacturing uh, for, the for the most part, uh, with it all being uh, mostly being a hands-on type of uh, proposition. So, um, Kevin, uh, how, does, uh, how do the specific needs of manufacturing um, really weigh in on considerations for, for staffing. I mean, um, uh, there was the mention about safety uh, and, um, and uh, beneficial or easier working environments. Um, uh, and so is there a real, um, is there a real push there uh, by, by companies in um, uh, it, it really paying attention to, um, uh, to needs of workers then? Right. Yeah. I mean, when I think of manufacturing, I, I don't think of just on the shop floor, right? I think of the, the whole uh, supporting organization. And of course, on the shop floor, we got to be there. But in some roles, um, it's, it is appropriate to, to work uh, from home in, in, in certain instances. And what I'm seeing folks do is more the hybrid uh, environment, um, trying to maintain uh, a culture as an organization. So Wanting to get some folks uh, in house at, at, at some point during the week, whether it's two days or or three days um, in house, and then and then working from home because what they might do depending on their role, uh, depending on what they're doing during that day, they might be more productive at home and and have less interruptions. And so um, again, as we look to figure out. How do we make folks more productive in organizations? What they might need from in a, in a working from home environment and what they need in a working in the office environment. We want to understand those things and again, give them the tools and the capabilities to be most productive in, in each one of those environments. Okay. And uh, and Heather, uh, I see you have your hand raised. Do you want to uh, add to that? Yeah, I guess mine's mostly just kind of a question because we find it in our industry very challenging to have people working from home in like the office sector because it, it actually, it has more of a morale issue with like people on the shop floor. And it's like, well, if they're not here, why the heck does it matter if I'm here type of thing? So I'm kind of curious on what other people did there. And then, I mean, work flexibility is the number one thing I hear a different economic development stuff about well, the mom hours, so to speak, and it's like nine to three. And I'm curious, and if there's people that are doing more of these types of work flexibility hours in the manufacturing sector, because we really can't get around having a whole lot of work from home type um, things going on. Jeff, I, Jeff, I wonder if maybe uh, you guys have any experience in that space up hell and just curious what you've run into. Yeah, I mean, I think as the team mentioned, we love having the support teams here with the manufacturing team. There's no better place than to be out on the shop floor, you know, to help make things better and help find those productivity opportunities. Um, we do think flexible schedules is key to opening the um, pool of possible candidates, right, uh, for our operations. And so there's a, and we don't think that the plant has to have one schedule, right? So there's multiple schedules inside of our uh, operations in order to be able to accommodate that. And it um, turns into then folks' ability to um, get a good work-life balance with it and match the needs that they have. Now, it's not, not infinite schedules, but give you an example. We have like a Coleman schedule, right, where people are working four tens and then they're off and then they work the next four tens and then they're off. And what, what they have to work a weekend, you know, they get a weekend off every three, if you will, with that type of schedule. 
but it's really helpful for us to get 60 hours of work, if you will, but nobody's having to work overtime, more than 40 hours in a week. So there are options like that. We don't, don't have really any part-time jobs, if you will, maybe, you know, as Heather was referencing some of those types of schedules that might be more conducive to uh, people that are raising a family as well. But we are getting creative in uh, how we think about schedules and how we think about each area not necessarily having to be on its own schedule. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And Hey, Ann, I want to ask you a question here and just to, to, to see if you've got some input. Uh, obviously, labor and Iowa has demographic challenges and labor challenges outside of just manufacturing. Um, that's also a longer term challenge potentially. So I'm just curious, as you're looking at the labor market, and if you were talking to manufacturers, what would you be projecting in that space? And um, curious what your thoughts are there. Well, I thought Heather's comment about uh, hiring people older by using cobots was was a, a very interesting thing to hear about. In the data, it's very clear that the people who didn't come back to the labor market post pandemic are older. So they're there whether it's whether it's safety whether it's you know there were certain things that were physically challenging uh, and you can deal with some of that on with cobots i i think that's a group that's there that's had experience that have certain blocks to getting them back uh, you know in the beginning i think it, it, when we didn't have vaccines it, if people were older they were at higher risk and so and so you know you can understand that now we have vaccines. Uh, and so if we're able to induce those people to come back, that could be a very helpful thing. And, um, and Gabe, I, I wanted to uh, ask you, and this seems like a good um, uh, uh, opportunity to ask about your labor outsourcing strategy. Uh, you told me that uh, your your production facility uh, is uh, located in Malaysia. And uh, uh, tell, us, uh, tell us about the decision behind that. Um, have you always uh, out, uh, outsourced? And um, uh, what, what, um, uh, how does that affect your labor strategy? Yeah, there's some blessings and curses behind what happened. Now, we're a startup company, a venture-backed startup company. Uh, in the early days, we built, made, iterated, tested everything right here in Iowa, actually with a lot of uh, great, great companies here in Iowa that were willing to be guinea pigs as we, we tried to figure out how to, how to refine and fine-tune the technology. Um, when it came to production, um, one of the, the, the key things that our investors were looking for uh, was an end-to-end -end operation, somebody that could produce everything from the, the, the PCBs, the printed circuit boards, all the way through plastics production assembly. And, and uh, that really limited where we were going to be able to look. So obviously, we, we looked where most of that stuff is produced over in Southeast Asia, uh, landed uh, on a facility in Penang, Malaysia, that does a lot of production for companies here in the United States. Uh, we're one of the smaller companies that they, that they work with. Now that provided us a, a couple of advantages. One, we, we were really fortunate. We ordered a lot early out of the gate and we got most of our inventory brought in before everything hit. Um, we also saw the effects of COVID-19 about four months before we did here in the United States. And so we were sitting here watching what was happening over there, knowing that things were gonna be incredibly difficult. And that helped us make some challenging business decisions in those very early days of us actually taking a product to market. Our product launch was scheduled for April of 2020. After four and a half years worth of R&D and heart and soul and blood, sweat and tears, um, our big event that we had planned for, for that was canceled. Now, the other thing that also happened was uh, they came out of it, the initial surge, they came out of it before we did here. We were still trying to figure things out. We were trying to figure out, are we in essential service? That was a term I'd never even known. They don't teach that in business college, you know, uh, 10 years ago, right? And so all of those things that, that uh, we were trying to figure out over here, we were able to then, then be able to get back up and going over there a little bit earlier. Then again, later, it presented more challenges to us because uh, again, how things were handled over there was handled much differently than they are over here. So uh, it's been interesting. It's provided me a very global perspective on things and to be able to see how tightly connected everything from a you know tiny little flake of pepper component 
to a, an automobile, to uh, combines, to, I mean, you name it, all the things that are produced over here, um, that, was, that was a side of the, the global economics that I had never seen before. Um, but I, again, I, I, uh, I want to be encouraging. I, we are starting to see um, some positive movement on pricing. Uh, logistics is still absolutely out of control, and I don't know when. I don't. I don't see. Anne will probably have a better, a better look into the future on that one. I just don't see light at the end of the tunnel right now. I'm, I'm going to be over in Malaysia in three weeks, and I'm actually thinking about loading up a, a suitcase and bringing a suitcase full of holsters back. You know, as a, as a carry, because it's seven thousand dollars to ship that back, or I could just put it in a carry on and check my bag for 150 bucks. With the proper paperwork, but anyway, just, just don't try to bring back. Just don't try to bring back, you know, like a breakfast sandwich that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, be fine for that. So, anyways, it's it's interesting, kind of navigating those those two worlds. But again, a lot of our work uh, here is with uh, manufacturers in the United States, certainly all across Iowa, um, South America, and now uh, into Indonesia and Eswatini over over in Africa. So it's been interesting to get that perspective from all different parts of the world. And um, a question uh, from our audience um, um, uh, in the area of uh, information and cybersecurity, um, um, what are what are some uh, priorities, I guess, in um, uh, in that area? I mean, is that um, uh, is that rising to the uh, to the top right now or 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 is it just kind of in the background? Uh, yeah, Joe, I can weigh in on that. Um, it's kind of, it's in the background, but we have to be very cognizant of it as we're embarking upon a lot of smart factory initiatives. You know, there's probably one terabyte of data a day coming out of every one of our factories, right? And uh, harnessing that and using that, I think is going to be key to um, uh, our ability to get more productive going forward as well. But as you connect machines, you tap into PLCs, you get all this stuff on the cloud as well. You get all this data and data lakes and data warehouses. There's definite need for security around that, uh, all, all aspects of our business there. It's not like a machine center sitting in the corner of the plant anymore. And you got an HMI and you're just having an operator connect to it. Everybody is tapped into that stuff, just like the smart home stuff as a consumer, or the smart factory stuff needs that as well. But I got to say, it's not like that's the first thing we go to. It's a kind of a table stakes, right? To be in that particular game and to advance manufacturing more into the digital uh, world. That's where it's really starting to uh, come into play. Yeah, any other uh, any other thoughts on the um, uh, information uh, security or? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll jump in, um, go back to my uh, CEO days, which last year, not too far back, right? Um, and we definitely had problems in regards to 70% uh, of our business was international. And so brought in a whole host of characters that would try to get in and um, uh, either uh, act as a, as a customer, as another customer and, and try to uh, have a switch uh, banking instructions to posing as a certain in individual, um, trying to get a, 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 a wire sent um, or going, getting into our system. And so we had uh, regular training, we had um, testing that would go on and folks would be tested about, you know, do they hit that email or, or do they not? And just constantly bringing that to the forefront of everybody because one, one person making one mistake can, can open up your company. And so training, audit, testing, um, and just continue having that in front of folks would be uh, something that I would recommend. And, um, and I can imagine that with all of the, the volatility and uncertainty going around, uh, uh, there are a lot of changes with suppliers or with, uh, with financial institutions where uh, maybe it would have been unusual to be changing um, relationships, but now uh, that's much more common. So, um, are are there um, are there either internal um, um, ways uh, that companies are addressing supply chain shortages, or are there 
uh, any national or state initiatives or legislation that have been helpful in that uh, in that area. Um, and I was going to move to specifically the chip bill um, and and what that might do. But uh, Heather, uh, did you want to uh, uh, talk on that or? I was mostly want to talk about the fact that I think a lot of financial institutions at least in our world have kind of done more relationship based and they've done a lot better about and maybe it's just an Iowa thing but you're saying more with the relationship and you hey I banked with this person for whatever 10 years five years 15 whatever happens to be and they will actually seem to go out of their way more to try to make sure they're helping and servicing you they feel like especially since the pandemic versus kind of the other way around of what we saw back in like 2014 15 type of time frame i think that's a little bit different to kind of go with your question i can't really speak to it much i mean it's just it's very different than what we see in our industry yeah and uh, any other uh, thoughts on the on um helpfulness of the uh, the government um, uh, regarding supply chain issues or um, any uh, any direct impacts that uh, you think that Iowa manufacturers may see with the uh, um, uh, the chip um, uh, or the, the current um, economic package that uh, just went through? Well, so one of the things I think the government is trying to do, which is helpful, is to provide some certainty into a very uncertain environment. So, you know, here, here is some funding and it's going to be for multi years because particularly with these chip plants, it takes time for them to come online two to three years. Uh, so, so making that kind of statement that we understand that this is a strategic and national priority, I think is very helpful, particularly when many of the countries that, that particularly with regard to China, that we compete against uh, have had a lot of state investment and, and simply state-owned enterprises for a very long time. So I think that, that this is important for us to, to flag this because everybody has indicated these are problems. Uh, and, and more geopolitical stuff, it's China itself. A lot of those chips are made in Taiwan. We just had news about uh, political pressures with Taiwan. So we know how sensitive that is. We know that China is now doing military exer practice exercises, but, but we've learned something from all this, that if we don't take care of certain strategic interests, we could be in big trouble. And uh, Jeff, uh, you uh, have, have your hand raised. Yeah, it's uh, probably well out of my pay grade to understand the chips bill, but uh, making stuff in good old God bless America is never a bad uh, thing, I don't think. I think most of the help has not come from the government policies. It's more self-help from companies, you know, reshoring or bringing stuff back to shorten the supply chain, take the transportation out of it and be in country or source in region, I'll call it, maybe not even in region for the region that um, you know, you're making products and for the customers in that region. And that's been kind of a trend, I would say, over the last five years, just in the experiences I've had, that for that to be happening. So it wasn't just because all of a sudden we had these major supply chain issues and ports blocked and taken you know, months to get stuff. And as Gabe said, four times the amount of cost to get it in. It's kind of been that evolution. And so I think companies are pulling self-help levers when it comes to shortening up and um, reducing, trying to reduce those areas where there's variation in the mix. And I will add one other thing to that because it's not just for product where I think we've fallen short and, and I don't know if you can weigh in on this, where I think we've fallen short in supply is our ability to get equipment and tools. So all of those have microchips you know, in them as well. And so that has extended lead times for what we thought might be capacity coming online, it took longer than expected. And now lead times for even robots and some of the things we got talking about earlier, you got to get your orders in early because they are still quite extended um, as we speak. So it not only hindered the direct material piece that goes in the product, it hindered the ability for manufacturers to get capacity because the supply of electronic uh, stuff, chips uh, specifically, hindered the availability of the final equipment. 
I, I would also say, you know, Ann, Ann made a really good point there. We've recognized, again, the fragility of the system. We've, we've identified some very critical weak points uh, in, in our economy here. And the fact that we're taking a long-term vision of it and not just saying it's probably going to figure itself out, because really, by, by the time chip production really starts to get to capacity here in the U.S., we'll, we'll be past this. We will absolutely be past this. I'm confident we will be. But it's for how do we make sure that we take take fragility out of the system? Uh, one, uh, a really good book on this is uh, Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. Really good book about helping to recognize and understand where the fragile points of an organization are uh, and then how to address those. So if, uh, if you're looking for some reading material, that's a, that's a great book. Are there, um, are there things that, um, that you wish uh, your customers uh, or your suppliers uh, recognized or knew that, um, uh, that uh, perhaps uh, need to be emphasized? Uh, I mean, uh, ways of doing business that are better, um, um, that uh, like how can, you, how can you make life easier for your supplier or for your manufacturer, I guess? Are there any thoughts? in that area yeah there are a few one of them being that we're not japan we can't do the just in time in the united states that theory that came around mm, back in the 90s and still kind of keeps hanging on it's great it's wonderful when you're on an island and you're literally all of your vendors are just down the road from you you can do just in time like that the pandemic made it even more so and kind of hitting more on what gabriel and ann said <clears throat> we have a lot of weak points and then our vendors themselves they will have say hey i can make you this widget and i can make you this widget and then the overall original equipment manufacturer will say well i need all of these component pieces but so and so can only make me widget a and b and so and so can make me widget d so then vendor c has to be able to do something Z, which completely topples the apple cart. Like, so my thing is, is work with the vendors. Don't just be like, hey, I'm changing my order right now. And that's one of the things that we're starting to see more and more of is the ones that have that flexibility in their businesses who can kind of forecast, who can see, who are talking to their own end users a little bit more. All right, do you really need this or are you just buying? The, the hard part that we saw in 2021 and even now is that there's a lot of purchasers that will just kind of fear buy still because they're like oh well i don't want to be short because your lead times are a year out well yeah my lead times are a year out so that i can kind of keep play catch up a little bit it's not that i want you to do another massive order of a hundred thousand pieces of something that usually takes you two years to be able to utilize and so it's one of those things that is just like all right actually look at what you need what your production can do and work with your vendors instead of just demanding. I think gone are the times of that whatever Ford and John Deere type mentality of I'm the big guy and I can push all my vendors around. You got to work with them because otherwise you're just going to be like, well, I'm going to work with people that actually want to work with me. And so, there's so, so much demand going on. So has the equation of uh, long-term relationships between suppliers and companies, uh, has that been really shook by current conditions then? And, and maybe that's uh, part of what is contributing to all this volatility? To a point, I think the biggest part about it is, is the ones that actually have the relationship, truly have relationship, don't just state it, has been strengthened. And they're the ones that get service first. And then the ones that just kind of demand things and expect things because they're like, well, I'm used to getting it at this lead time. So I expect you to do it at this lead time. I don't care what you're telling me right now, whether they're a small guy or a big guy, that's not going to happen. They have to look at reality. And I think that's, that's really what's going on with us. And I think it makes a major, it affects things a lot more than they think they realize. Any other, uh, any other thoughts on this, um, uh, on this uh, aspect of, uh, you know, like what, uh, what, uh, you know, lessons learned, uh, or what, uh, what should we should um, um, uh, both suppliers and, um, and, um, and companies be thinking about? Yeah, yeah I, think I just want to no, sorry, 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 jump in. Um, follow up with Heather, um, who I thought made a really good point that I just wanted to just 
dig a little deeper on. And that is, uh, you brought about what, what you can do with working with your customers and vendors. And on the customer side, I do think particularly on where parts and in, in, in the in the servicing of parts that there is a bit of panic buying going on, which which only exacerbates the problem. And it used to be we would be promoting those parts and let's go and let, let's get those big parts orders. But it it just has this this effect that just cascades throughout the rest of your parts customers and your manufacturing operation. So communicating that look, the parts are going to be there, that we're going to have, that you're going to have availability, and to try and uh, communicate a little bit better with your with your customers in that regard uh, can make a positive impact for you to kind of manage your inventory levels. But I, I just wanted to follow up on Heather's point there. So that was really good. Jeff, it looked like you were going to chime in also. Yeah, I was just going to kind of weigh in on what Heather said early on in the program, which is it's about the supply chain, not necessarily just manufacturing. And we think about supply chain, right? Plan, source, make, deliver, the textbook areas of it. The planning piece of it, I think, is um, really important, especially in these times. And not only developing it internally, but that communication back to the supplier. So the amping up of our SNOP process, which now many folks refer to as IBP, right? Integrated business planning is really trying to help us strengthen those relationships with facts and data around what our business outlook is going to be going into the future. So there's a lot, little bit more confidence in investing in capacity in the supply base uh, as well. So I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the planning aspects of what we do in supply chain as well. Well, Jeff, there's a, a nice follow-up question here. They want to know whether you're coming out with a Harley Davidson model uh, model windows. So we'll see if you guys have some nice product collaboration there. Yeah, color schemes. Look for different yeah. color schemes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, the architects of the home decide that. But. Right. I, I'd like to ask a question and and kind of ask each of you that, to answer this, which is, you know, a lot of times we like to just get a sentiment. If you look out for the next year and you're thinking about your business, but also what you're hearing from other manufacturers. Um, just to give us kind of a feel for um, how optimistic you are about your business as you're going forward and, and the industry. And so um, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll pick on Gabe since I know, I know you a little bit from the, from uh, your early entrepreneur days. So uh, what's, what's your outlook looking like and what's your optimistic level uh, look like at this point? Well, see, uh, it's not fair because everybody on this panel that's a business leader is just by by default just a little bit optim more optimistic. You know, we look at you have to otherwise go jump off a bridge. So, you know, I would say I would say I'm uh, I'm very optimistic though. If if the situation wasn't backlogs of orders and still high demand and consumer spending, you know, is still good, I, I would feel you know far less optimistic. It's such a weird situation that we're in where uh, we're seeing these pressures and these uh, the inflation numbers that we're seeing, but unemployment is so low, right? It's, there's, there's not a problem with jobs and finding jobs. Um, there's a problem with uh, trying to hire people. Um, so I, I'm incredibly optimistic for what the future brings. And I think we're seeing companies uh, get more strategic in thinking about long term and how do they weather storms, uh, you know, like this. Hopefully, we'll, we won't go through another pandemic anytime soon. Um, but again, I think it, it helped us recognize where there was opportunity for us to improve, whether it's from, you know, investing in automation, industry 4.0 technologies, investing more in our people. And I would say the most important thing is uh, that I would say would be look at the people, uh, go talk to the people, understand what your what your labor force is looking for, what will what will make them uh, happy. I think the Gallup poll said salary was like 12th on the list, right? So it, it's not always just raising the pay, uh, although that's important at a time when inflation is so high, um, but it's so many other intangible things, quality working environment, work-life balance, other things like that. And I think um, manufacturing, the manufacturing industry as a whole is, is going to have to find strategies that work to embrace some sort of that, because I, I think that's the new norm. Uh, and for the time being, that's how it's going to be. And the, and the companies that win will be the ones that figure some things out there, I think. We'll, we'll stick with our manufacturers and then I'll, I'll come around to, to Ann and Kevin. But uh, Heather, you want to talk a little bit about what your optimism level looks like as you're looking out for the next year or so? Uh, my optimism is right up there with Gabe's. Um, I'm very optimistic. I think that the ag industry, especially in the Midwest, because of everything going on worldwide, is just giving us more and more opportunities to supply the world. 
Um, we're really excited. We have a lot of new opportunities with new customers kind of knocking on our doors that really weren't knocking on it before. So we're really, we're really excited. Our biggest thing is get in that backlog. We get that backlog under control. And I think that it's just the world is our oyster. So we're excited. And Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I think I was mentioning earlier kind of the macro trends around housing um, and shelter requirements here, especially in the U.S., are, are there and they're strong and they bode well for the construction industry. I think we'll see steep uh, peaks and valleys maybe more frequent than we used to, and all predicated on some of the interest rate changes that are going on, uh, maybe some of the other regulatory you know, constraints that might exist and quite honestly it'll come back to labor are there enough people to build the houses to build the apartments to be able to pull through right the amount of uh, materials needed in the in the building sector so i think it comes down to that but uh, we're cautiously optimistic and this team has already kind of referenced it right let's focus on we're high, laser focused on what we can control and to make sure that we can influence our end outcome and, and lot in life as we move forward. But I would say there's a bit of optimism around the general notion of uh, the next one to two years here in manufacturing in Iowa. And Kevin, from, from your perspective, talking with multiple folks, are, are you still hearing um, growth type of conversations or are you hearing some folks trying to shelter down a little bit? No, I, I, everybody I've talked to, consistent story, um, strong order flow, um, trying to figure out how to get the orders out the door you know, is, is, is more of the challenge. And so, you know, Ann, we'll, I'm, I will talk next, I know, but you know, that GDP number, I think there's a lot of inventory that was sitting, waiting to get out the door. Um, and um, had that flow been there, it would not have been a, a, a down course. I'm curious for her to speak, speak to that, but the, the optimism for order flow is great. People are still taking action, whether it's in the US or, or internationally. And again, I think that there are, you know, this, this has forced companies and folks like us to think about new tools and ways, new ways of doing things. So I like hearing, you know, what the folks have said. And again, we've got some interesting tools that to help folks not only retain, but then get the right folks in the door and position those folks in the right spot, all impacting organizational productivity and doing more with the folks that you have. And Anne. Yeah, so uh, Kevin, I'm happy to speak to the GDP uh, number. So we, it, it's an undeniable fact that we had two back-to-back -back quarters of negative GDP, but when you unpack that, you're absolutely right that the second one had to do with investment and inventory. Even the first one had to do with what are called net exports, the difference between exports and imports. So we were, during that particular quarter, we had a lot more imports and that is a negative number that brought GDP down. So people were still consuming and, and that's an important thing. That, that people are willing, because that's 70% of GDP, they just happen to be buying um, imports. And so, if we can keep manufacturing and having goods that people want, then that's going to turn that around because the consumer is there, as other people have said, uh, you know, lots of other things are there. So even those two negative uh, quarters of GDP were special uh, as everything is right now. We've had enormous shocks, COVID, supply chain, the war, they just keep coming. And so the economy is still trying to, to adjust to that. But underneath it, I agree with, with everybody else who's on the ground, we're strong. And, and, and one quick. Oh, God. Uh, Joe, I'm just going to quick follow up oh, question, cool. Ann, and then I'll get you. Sure. Uh, there. It, yep. When you, when, and when you're looking, if, if you were asking, telling people to look at some indicators that are coming up here in the next uh, few months or weeks or so, what are some of the things you'd be looking at to? To, to see which way the wind is kind of starting to blow? So we always focus on the consumer. Uh, what are they looking on? At? That's important. And that's why this, you know, it's, it's hard for manufacturers to find labor, but if people have jobs, then they can buy things, then, you know, consumption goods, houses, all kinds of other things. So that's a very, very important thing to focus on the, on the consumer. Now, if you ask the consumer how they feel, 
consumer sentiment surveys are low. They're worried about all these things, but they keep buying and uh, and they have jobs. So so that's that's an important part. So I so I would you know certainly always focus on the on the on the consumer. Uh, focus on these supply chain issues because we really need to either do more uh, so-called uh, just-in-case supply chain rather than just-in-time, also sometimes referred to as nearshoring. You know, the value of having your supplier close to you has gone way, way up. Uh, so, so that's a good thing for domestic manufacturers. The, the one thing I would continue to be concerned about uh, our energy prices because it's such a primary input. It affects everything. Prices are moving in the right direction right now, but we've had so many unprecedented shocks. And so even our domestic, again, it's good news for the United States. We're one of the big three energy producers, but we we have, you know, we could be one shock away of refineries being taken out because you know because of weather related things so so there's still concern about that joe okay yeah i just have uh, i just have one thing i wanted to mention on that topic uh, iowa gdp um uh, the iowa innovation council five years ago they set a goal of 32 billion for manufacturing gdp for the state and according to data I saw recently, um, the state met that goal actually, uh, or very close, 31.7 uh, billion in GDP. So uh, there was there's been good growth in GDP in the past five years. Um, uh, quickly, any any expectations? Can we can we do as well in the next five years? It sounds like there's a lot of opti optimism out there. So um, I'm guessing the answer may be yes for most of you. Yeah, because some of the shocks that are undeniably coming, for example, uh, have to do with commodity prices. And, and, and so Iowa has a big agriculture component, even seeds that are dr drought resistant, things like that. That stuff is very, very important. But, but Gabe stuff, uh, if, if, if workers feel better about going to work, that's a very big deal. I mean, Pella is on that. So, so all of these things are, are just very important. Well, we are getting close to the end of our time here, and I do want to give each of the panelists a chance to give a final takeaway uh, for our audience. So I'm going to give you each a minute to think about. Uh, it could be something maybe we haven't talked about, something you want to make sure gets, uh, gets part of the conversation today in order to give a closing thought. Uh, before we do, I do have a few things I'd love to share with everybody here today. First of all, if you have any feedback today, please feel free to send it my way. We're always working to continue to make programming like this better. Uh, and would love to have you reach out my way if you have any uh, uh, ways that we could be doing that. Secondly, Joe, uh, as we mentioned, of course, he's our manufacturing writer. If something today sparked uh, a story idea, you think there's something he should be covering, uh, please make sure to reach out his way as well. Uh, he's always looking for great story ideas to share with our audience. Uh, I want to plug Made in Iowa one more time as well. Uh, that's going to be our, our September 30th edition of the Business Record. Uh, if you're interested in participating in that, uh, you can reach out my way directly as well, or you can go to the URL that we're going to throw in the chat. That's madeiniowabr.com slash advertise. While you're there, you can check out past editions and see some of the other companies that we have profiled over the past few years. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to be taking the content from today. Joe's going to be writing about it within our daily e-newsletter. We're going to have content that shows up in the business record as well. Uh, if you don't subscribe to our products, you can do that at businessrecord.com slash subscribe. We'd love to have you a part of what we produce so that you're seeing and staying up to date with everything going on in the industry. Um, also, I uh, want to uh, go ahead now. We'll go to each of our panelists to give them a final chance to give a final takeaway. And we'll go ahead and go uh, with Anne to have you go ahead and give us a, your first uh, final takeaway. So I, I think that there are certainly many concerns on, on the horizon with regard to inflation, uh, Fed policy, even fiscal policy uh, that, that are real. Uh, inflation is high. There's no question about that. But I'm very sure that the Fed is committed to bringing it down. And that's a very important thing because that will lend to the stability of the business environment that everybody needs uh, to, to 
plan productively for for the economy. So so that is a red flag, but I think it's 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 being managed. And my final thought in terms of challenges is 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 just concerns about energy uh, prices. Um, and and right now they're moving in the in the right direction, but I would I hope that we stop seeing all these really unusual shocks. Uh, and, and, you know, I wouldn't want to see something like um, weather issues disrupt major things that could happen anywhere. We're seeing some of this in Europe right now. Thanks, Anne. And yeah, we'll go with Heather next. Uh, my main takeaway, I think, in general is if your business seems like it's positive, stay positive. Don't don't get caught up in in what competition's doing. Don't get caught up in what you're hearing on the news because unfortunately, news negative things sell all the time. Um, not, I would not say, here at the not here at the business record. No, so not the business record. Right. Thanks. <laughs> um, but in general, just just if your business thinks if it looks positive, stay positive, and kind of like what a few of the other panels said keep doing what you yourself are doing for your company and and stay strong in what you can win as so thanks heather and and uh as as you mentioned negative things pretend may, maybe do sell but uh what we try to do is we always like to take the challenges and put them back through that good lens uh to help people find solutions to that and so uh, hopefully we're helping folks do that here today as well so uh jeff we'll go to you next yeah thanks uh chris i think as everybody mentioned we are in quite a VUCA economic and geopolitical environment that we're having to survive in. So a quick shout out to every manufacturing person in Iowa, across the country, quite honestly, for the resiliency that they have um, shown through these very unprecedented times. It's been quite amazing. And I quite honestly am inspired by what I've seen and what I see inside of our operations day in and day out. I still think there's three key things, the continuing labor shortage and inflationary pressures that come with it. The accelerating energy potential interruptions. I think Ann, you know, highlighted on that, and that was a topic we didn't touch on much. But I think energy interruptions and inflations that come from that, and then this notion of chasing demand volatility for a variety of reasons that that's in the system. We're going to have to have um, systems and solutions that deal with those. And you know, the winners will clearly meet these head on with creative solutions for sure. But always, and it gets back to what Heather was saying, serve the customer eliminate waste, and becoming the employer of choice are the three things that we're actively uh, pursuing day in and day out. Thanks, Jeff. And we'll go with Kevin next and give, give Gabe the final thought. Yeah, I just wanted to hit upon us, as, as Jeff just did, about this, this crazy world that we live in now, um, this VUCA world. And so some things we haven't talked about, there's, you know, solutioning. And um, first of all is more important than ever is is access to data, you know, what's going on. Um, don't wait to the annual strategic planning process, have a good flow of, of information coming in the organization as well as going through. So communication around your organization and environment of sharing information. And then in addition, um, you know, we have that North Star, that mission and, and so forth at a high level. But as you push those tactics down, creating environment and a culture that allows for flexibility because you're gonna know things are gonna change. You know that, um, it's tough to forecast uh, this world, but you know things are gonna change. So allowing for flexibility and, and, and people to make uh, decisions is so critical in this, in this new environment. So data, communication within the organization and um, flexibility and, and decision making down in your organization help get you through these challenges that will undoubtedly arise. All right. And Gabe, you get the final thought. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. And thanks. Thanks, Joe and Stacy as well. Uh, and Kevin, Heather, Jeff, it's been an honor being on the panel. I know I'm taking so much away from this conversation and I hope everyone listening uh, was able to do the same. I would say we've got a couple of things going for us because we're here in Iowa and we're Iowans. We have so much support uh, in the manufacturing community. ABI obviously is, is a, a linchpin in all of this. And so thank you to, to their support for this program and for all the great things that they do for Iowa manufacturing. I think if we were anywhere else in the country, uh, we'd probably have struggles uh, that, that, that couldn't be overcome or what would be harder to overcome. Because we're here in Iowa, we, we pull together. And so I would encourage people, if you're out there trying to figure out 
you know, what can I do? I'm dealing with the labor shortage stuff. I'm dealing with production issues. Uh, look to organizations like ABI. Look at IOE Economic Development Authority. There are funds available to invest in industry 4.0 strategies and tactics. There are solutions that are out there that can help augment some of these challenges that you're facing with the lack of labor force. Uh, so I would encourage you to take action, go look, ask around, call the peers, talk to anyone on this panel. I'm sure they would be happy to take your questions and point you in different directions. I know I certainly would. And again, thank you to the business record for putting this on and for allowing me to be a part of this uh, distinguished panel. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Gabe. And thanks again to everybody for uh, being part of the panel again today. I want to thank everybody in the audience as well for attending and taking the time to better understand uh, the manufacturing industry and what the effects could possibly be. We too are manufacturer and work each uh, day and each week to produce the business record, both print and digitally, and we're a locally owned business as well. So the lessons from today are things we're definitely going to be applying to that as well. Um, and of course, there's many ways that you can help support us uh, as well so that we're able to continue to provide programming like this. If you're not already a member, we'd love to have you as a member of the business record. You can do that at businessrecord.com slash membership. And of course, you can feel free to reach out my way if you're interested in any advertising opportunities or sponsorships like we had available for today's event. Uh, if you're, uh, in addition, I want to just go ahead and thank again our, our sponsors, McKee, Voorhees, and Cease, and Light Edge Solutions, both of our supporting sponsors today, and also to ABI for your presenting sponsorship and for helping start this with us a few years ago as well. You guys power out Iowa businesses, and uh, you help our, our, are helping power our business as well. Now, again, we've got some links back in the in the chat again, if you'd like to use those to see the videos. Uh, also, a list of upcoming events for ABI that you can participate in as well. And then finally, of course, you saw the, the nice thank yous in the chat. But once again, thank you to our panelists for being here today. We really appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. Thanks for providing your insight. Again, I'm Chris Konetsky, group publisher of BPC, Joe Gardia's senior staff writer with The Business Record. Thank you for being with us today and have a great afternoon. Thanks all. Panelists, if you want to stick around for just one second, if, you, if you've if you got the time, we'll just uh, do a quick little wrap once we get everybody off the uh, um, back end part.